Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you to Brucon again for allowing me to speak here. So the research that I will speak about today, it was done in collaboration with Domin Schepers and Ajan Ganganathan from Northeastern University. And I am Mati van Oef, as mentioned in the introduction. And maybe an in interesting little fact, it was actually at uh, Brucon that I gave my first presentation uh, ever. And I just checked, and that was already more than 11 years ago. Um, and I still remember very well at the time thinking, uh, because I also did a presentation on Wi-Fi security then, that I was so lucky that I was able to find this vulnerability in Wi-Fi uh, and then give a presentation about it. At that time, I thought to myself, yeah, I'm never going to find anything in Wi-Fi again. I just got lucky once. Fortunately, though, uh, over those past uh, 10 well, 11 years. You may have heard some other research that we did. So in the past, um, I also discovered some other vulnerabilities to give a short introduction, like Crack, Fragatex, and Dragonblood, that all had their nice corresponding logo. And we also didn't just purely looked at attacks. We also looked at some defenses, where we, for example, uh, helped standardize operating channel validation and beacon protection on beacon protection will actually become mandatory in Wi-Fi 7. So we have quite some background in Wi-Fi security, and today we'll just continue this trend of uh, breaking some networks and basically having fun with Wi-Fi devices. You may have also um, seen that in the past we did some security about uh, VPN uh, stuff as well. That was in collaboration with New York University Abu Dhabi. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today. Um, who knows next year? And just as a side note, we collaborate with industry, so if you want to collaborate as well, feel free to ask me. But yeah, today we're going to continue this trend of investigating Wi-Fi security. And before I want to start with the details of the talk, let me give some quick background on Wi-Fi security. More than two decades ago, Wi-Fi got introduced, and they first added the web encryption protocol, and as you, most of you in this room may know, web got very quickly broken. Um, maybe a show of hands, whoever tried to break a web protocol back in the day, exactly this is what I assumed, so no need to go in detail there. In response to that, they introduced WPA 1 and 2, um, and that was secure for quite a long time. In fact, people assumed it was secure for over a few decades, but then um, the key reinstallation attack was discovered against it, which was a more fundamental flaw against WPA2. Fortunately, it was possible to patch this vulnerability, uh, but still WPA2 has some fundamental shortcomings. For example, you can perform offline dictionary attacks against WPA2, and to prevent these attacks, the Wi-Fi Alliance, together with the IEEE, introduced WPA3 in 2018. Now, WPA3 had some issues as well, but those has be, have been fixed in the meantime. So these days, WPA3 really is uh, the modern standard to use. And today, we're going to... Uh, discuss some attacks against WPA 1 and 2, and some of them will also apply against the very latest version, namely WPA 3. Before I get really into the meat of the talk, I want to give um, a background on one vulnerability that inspired our research, and that is called the Crook attack. And what was discovered in this attack? Well, the target here was an access point, and the goal of the attackers was basically to make this access point leak frames in plain text. And how did they achieve this? Well, the first observation was that the access point, typically in hardware, sometimes in a Linux kernel, will buffer frames if the wireless medium is busy for some reason. For example, if another device is transmitting frames, the access point has to wait until that transmission is done before it can transmit its own frames. But more importantly, 
it will buffer frames in plain text. Typically with Wi-Fi, a frame is only encrypted right before you actually transmit it. And what did these researchers discover? They discover if an, attackers, if an attacker pretends to be the victim and sends a so-called so disassociation frame, and the disassociation frame basically means, hey, I'm the client and I'm about to leave the network. Um, in a WPA2 network, it is trivial to spoof these frames. Uh, in a WPA3 network, they are protected, and I'll come back to that in a bit. But basically, the access point will now believe, OK, this client is leaving the network. Therefore, I can remove all data associated to the client. And one of the things that will be removed are the keys associated to the client. So far, so good. But there is one problem. They forgot to clear these uh, frames that are buffered. And what actually happened when the wireless medium now becomes available again? This buffer is cleared and the frames are then leaked in plain text. And why in plain text? Well, because the keys just got removed. And quite a lot of devices were affected by this vulnerability. And in a sense, it's also very easy to ex execute. You simply send some disassociation frames. On the other hand, you do need some luck when executing the attack, because you need to send this disassociation frame right when the access point is buffering frames. So maybe you leak frames, but maybe you have bad luck and nothing is buffered, and you won't leak anything. And the goal of today is to basically improve this attack. And one way to think more generally about this attack is that frames are buffered here in this uh, time under a certain key. So frame, frames are buffered here under a certain security context. And later on, they are transmitted under a different security context, namely the key has now been removed. So if we try to generali generalize this vulnerability, our question is basically how are security context managed? And what do I mean with the security context? Well, I mean what happens if the key somehow gets deleted or you uh, refresh your security association? What then happens to buffered frames? And you may now wonder, OK, but what does that have to do with the title of the talk? There you talk about sleep mode. Well, the idea is that when a client goes to sleep, or at least when we pretend that a client goes to, to sleep, and then between the time that the client will wake up again, the security context might have changed of that victim. Now, this may sound a little bit abstract, but that's the question we asked. And to make it more concrete, this led to a few new attacks that we discovered against several devices. And today I will present three of those attacks. The first attack is, in a sense, a generalization of the Scrook attack, and we will be able to uh, more reliably cause an access point to leak plain text frames. So how does our attack work? Well, let's again assume that we have a victim here, a client uh, on the left, and we have the vulnerable access point here on the right. So it's actually the access point that we are going to attack. We assume that the victim here will connect to the Wi-Fi network, and in this case, we assume a WPA2 network. And the client yeah, will simply collect, connect to the network normally. The client will browse the internet, and encrypted frames will be exchanged between the client and the access point. What will the attacker now do? The attacker will spoof basically a power safe frame, and it's going to tell the access point, hey, I'm the client, and I'm going into sleep mode. Please buffer any frames for me. And this is actually our first improvement here of the crook attack. We can now much more reliably control when and how the access point is buffering frames. Because basically, we can just tell the access point, hey, start buffering frames, because I'm going into sleep mode. The second improvement that we discovered is that in the crook attack, they found that if you basically send a disassociation frame, so a frame 
telling the access point, hey, I'm about to leave, that that causes keys to be deleted. But we also discovered something else. If you pretend to be the client and you send an authentication or association frame, which basically tells the access point, okay, I'm the client again and I want to establish a new connection, that also works. Because it might be that the client uh, has lost connection and it might be trying to reconnect. And if the access point then notices that this client is trying to reconnect, it will basically remove the previous association, the previous uh, connection information that the access point stored, meaning we can again trigger, trigger the removal of keys on the access point side. Now if we make some space here, What, what is the situation we are in now? Well, the access point was still buffering these frames because it thinks that the client went into sleep mode. We now sent this association request causing the keys to be deleted. So you can, in a sense, expect what will happen. If we now tell the access point, okay, hey, I'm the client again, I'm now waking up. There are these frames that will be buffered and these buffered frames will now be transmitted and they are transmitted under what we call an undefined security context. Now, what do I mean with that? Well, the normal keys that are used to encrypt these frames are removed, and how the frames are now transmitted by the access point basically depends on the implementation. To give some examples, in a very simple case, um, and here I'm using FreeBSD as an example because it has a nice variation of all the ways that the access point may leak frames. And we can see that the behavior, so the result of the attack, depends on the specific operating system you are targeting, on the driver, and even on the version of the driver or the kernel. In some cases, we notice that these frames will simply be leaked in plain text, and then as an attacker, it's trivial. Uh, to inspect the content. With, other, with basically a newer version of that same driver, we suddenly notice that frames will then get uh, leaked, but encrypted using web, which is already horribly broken, but then also with an all zero key. Meaning they are encrypted, but of course we can just trivially decrypt them because we know the key. And in certain other cases, these frames, will be encrypted using the group key. And the group key is a key that all clients in the Wi-Fi network know. And it is used normally to encrypt broadcast on multicast frames. But with our attack, even unicast frames will be uh, then leaked and encrypted under this group key. And you may now wonder, OK, but you need the group key to then decrypt this frame. So does this really have an impact in practice? And the answer is yes because some Wi-Fi networks try to defend against malicious insiders. For example, if you have an enterprise network at your company, you might have client isolation enabled to prevent clients from attacking each other. Um, and depending on how that is implemented, a malicious insider may also know the group key and can therefore for still decrypt these frames. So this is an example of how uh, FreeBSD behaves, but basically we also found similar attacks on vulnerabilities against Linux, NetBSD, and also uh, against some wireless dongles themselves. So we, also, so we mainly tested open source uh, devices, and most of them, or a significant part of them, were vulnerable to uh, a variant of this attack. And if we look back, what is the root cause of this vulnerability? Well, in our opinion, the problem is that the Wi-Fi standard, so the IEEE 802.11 standard, is not really explicit on how an access point or a client needs to manage buffered frames. In particular, the standard never says that if a client is leaving the network, or if a client is disconnecting, the standard never explicitly says, oh yeah, by the way, you should then also remove all frames from all your buffers or queues. So this is likely why uh, developers forgot about this. And that also then uh, 
leads to a possible defense. A possible defense is simply always clearing these queues on buffers when a client disconnects. Another option, another possible defense, is to not buffer these frames in plain text, but already encrypt the frames before you buffer them. Um, that would also mitigate the security impact. So that's the first attack that we discovered. We also found uh, a second attack. On this second attack is against networks uh, that use management frame protection to basically prevent denial of service attacks, or at least it is supposed to prevent denial of service attacks. But we found a way to still forcibly disconnect clients even when you use a WPA3 network. Now let's maybe first give a bit of a background there so that we're all on the same page. Basically in Wi-Fi you have some very well-known denial of service attacks. You probably already know the deauthentication attack where you just spoof frames to disconnect everyone from the network. You can also spoof association frames and that basically has the same result that the client will get kicked off the network. Um, yeah, both of these attacks remove the state of the victim. Now, there is a defense against this, and this defense has actually existed for uh, easily more than 10 years, I think even close to 15 years now. And this defense is called management frame protection, and it wasn't immediately adopted in practice, so most WPA2 networks will not uh, support this. And if they support it, they might be buggy. However, with the new WPA3 standard, management frame protection became mandatory. And because of that, vendors more reliably implemented management frame protection. And yeah, with WPA3, it is now required to use management frame protection, which in theory means that you can no longer perform these very trivial deauthentication denial of service attacks. Well, some extra background. What does management fr frame protection actually do? Well, in Wi-Fi, you have three types of frames. You have management frames, which are used to scan for nearby networks and to manage the connection. You have control frames, which are used to manage the physical layer, so to acknowledge packets. And then you have data frames. And management frame protection will basically also assure that these management frames are encrypted and authenticated. Um, and when we did a Wi-Fi survey, so basically a Wi-Fi war drive uh, two years ago, we tried to measure how many networks already support management frame protection now. And at the time, we found that 5% of uh, home networks, well, networks in general, supported this. So in a sense, this is still a very low number. Hopefully, it will increase. On the other hand, it used to be even worse. But let's say that management frame protection indeed gets adopted more. Then we do have a new attack to still disconnect uh, clients from a network. And how will that defense work? Well, we can again assume the same situation as before. We have a victim here on the left and an access point that will be vulnerable to the right. And we can basically trick the access point into still removing clients from the network. So in this case, we basically assume that the victim is using WPA2 with management frame protection, or it's using WPA3, meaning it will use management frame protection. And how can we then still kick, or at least try to kick the client off the network? Well, we will send an association request to the access point, and this association request basically tells the access point, OK, I was the client that is already connected, but uh, yeah, maybe this client had to reboot, and it's now trying to reconnect. The adversary is basically spoofing that Wi-Fi frame. And it will also set the so-called sleep bit in the header of this Wi-Fi frame. Now, in a sense, this is a very strange thing to do, because we're basically spoofing a frame that tells the access point hey, I want to connect, oh yeah, but I'm immediately going into uh, sleep mode, into power save mode. So in a sense, that's a bit strange, but it's perfectly allowed by the Wi-Fi standard. 
on devices will also handle that frame. Now, we do assume that the client is using management frame protection, meaning an adversary can only spoof an unprotected association request, and the access point will notice this. The access point will notice that, hey, you're using management frame protection, but you're sending me a plain text association request, and how does the access point handle that when using management frame protection? Well, the access point will first deny this request because the access point realizes, oh, this may be an attacker. And then the access point will try to send a protected SA query frame, which is basically an encrypted and authenticated frame. And the access point wants to send this to the real client to see if the real client is still responsive. But you can see that something is going wrong here. This frame doesn't actually reach the victim. So what is going wrong here? Well, as you can see here, the implementation of the access point is typically split up in different components. And the component that handles the association request and that will send the SA query, it is typically implemented in user space. But the functionality that handles whether a client is in sleep mode and whether frames should be buffered is typically handled by the kernel or the hardware. So basically what happens here is that the access point in user space will see this association response, uh, will see the association request, it will deny this association, and then will send an SA query. But then the kernel or, or the hardware will realize, but oh, but this client is supposedly asleep, meaning, yeah, I will not actually send this SA query frame meaning it never reaches the victim. So at some point, a timeout uh, occurs here. So after this, a timeout occurs. And then the access point thinks, oh yeah, the real client indeed cannot respond to this challenge request. So the real client indeed either rebooted and lost its keys, or it's just no longer around. Um, which means that it is now okay to disconnect the client. And that means our attack now succeeded because now the access point will remove the client from the network uh, and then our denial attack, our denial of service attack succeeded. Now as a side note, we can also perform some other attacks by abusing the sleep mode. Um, there is also an extension to the Wi-Fi standard called fine timing measurements, which you can use to reliably measure the difference, uh, the distance from an access point to the client. And by abusing sleep mode, we can also manipulate these distance measurements, which can sometimes be used to mess with uh, geofencing. Uh, but for the details about that, uh, you can read our white paper. How do you how can we defend against this attack? So how can we prevent this new denial of service attack? Well, one example or one possible defense is to just never buffer these SA query frames. So never buffer these are you still connected frames. Another possibility is to authenticate the sleep bit so that an adversary cannot pretend that a victim is going into sleep mode. So to illustrate this, here in the attack, we sent this association request and we send a header. We, we set a bit in the header to basically tell the access point, hey, I'm going into sleep mode. But one defense would be to always authenticate this bit so that an adversary can never pretend that a client is going into sleep mode. So that is the second attack that we discovered. I will now talk about a third attack. And the goal of that third attack is to bypass client isolation. And what is client isolation? Well, the goal of client isolation is to block traffic between different clients of the same network. And the idea is then that clients will not be able to attack each other. Uh, and one trivial example is that you can then not no longer use ARP spoofing to intercept the traffic sent by 
another device. On the case of a Wi-Fi network, um, client isolation can also be securely implemented. In case you're a bit more familiar with Wi-Fi, in the next attack, I'm also going to assume that the so-called uh, whole uh, 100, 169 attack is prevented. Basically, we're going to assume that all Wi-Fi clients have unique encryption keys, meaning clients can not in any possible way inspect the traffic of each other. And basically, in a properly configured Wi-Fi network, client isolation would indeed defend against malicious insiders. But yeah, we are able to bypass that. And to give a bit more background on where client isolation is commonly used, it's, uh, it, it can be used also by your internal home network to, for example, isolate insecure IoT devices from each other. But it's also used a lot in enterprise net Wi-Fi networks, so uh, maybe in your company or in authenticated hotspots like Wi-Fi or Ethereum or Hotspot 2.0 which is sometimes also called uh, Passpoint. In these networks, client isolation is very commonly used to prevent clients from attacking from each other. And it might seem then that as an attacker, you can indeed no longer perform ARP spoofing uh, or ICMP redirect attacks to try to intercept the victim of another device in the network. Unless we manipulate the security context. So we are about to see an attack where it's still possible to intercept frames towards a device in a network. So how does that attack work? We again have the same situation. We assume that we have a client on the left, an access point on the right. The client will connect to the network. And then at some point, the client will send a certain request to the internet. You can, for example, imagine that this is a DNS or a plain text HTTP request. This Wi-Fi frame will arrive at the access point. The access point will decrypt it, because remember, we're assuming we use an encrypted Wi-Fi network. It will be forwarded to the internal router of that network, and that frame is then forwarded to the internet. Now, before the DNS or HTTP server on the internet can send a reply, the attacker will perform the attack. And what will the attacker do? The attacker will spoof the MAC address of the client, it will spoof the MAC address of the victim, and it will then try to connect with the access point. Now, how is this possible? How can the attacker connect him or herself to this protected Wi-Fi network? Well, remember, we are considering malicious insiders. So we assume that the attacker also has valid credentials to access the Wi-Fi network. So you can, for example, imagine that in your company, the device of someone got compromised, and that attacker is now trying to intercept frames of another uh, employee in the network. Or you can uh, imagine a network like Ethereum, where you also do not trust each other. Or you can imagine uh, one of these secure hotspots like Wi-Fi uh, or Hotspot 2.0, where you also need authentication and you need the correct credentials to connect to the Wi-Fi network, but you don't trust each other. So basically, we assume that the adversary can, has the correct credentials to connect to the network. And while connecting here to the network, the access point um, will then associate the keys that are negotiated when the adversary is connecting, it will associate these keys to the MAC address of the victim. Because the attacker can freely use any MAC address at once, and here it is spoofing the MAC address of the victim. Okay, so now the real victim was, is, in a sense, kicked off from the network. And the attacker now spoofed the victim's MAC address uh, and is now connected to the network. So what now happens if we finally receive the reply to the DNS or HTTP request? Well, this request from the internet will arrive at the router. The router will, will realize 
oh, this is a response to the message that this victim, that this client sent earlier. It's associated with a certain uh, IP address within that local network. And that local IP address is in turn associated with the MAC address of the victim, meaning the router will eventually just forward this DNS or HTTP reply to the MAC address of the victim. But of course, at that point, this MAC address is now basically associated with the attacker, meaning it will be encrypted using the keys of the attacker, so the response is basically sent to the attacker, him or herself. So in a way, this is actually a, a very trivial attack, right? I mean, you just spoof the MAC address of the victim, and you connect, and that's it. You now receive any pending frames that were still in transit to the victim. Now, there is one side remark here. Here, when we are trying to connect under the victim's MAC address, this is trivial when using WPA2 because you can trivially, very easily throw a client from the network. If you are using WPA, WPA3, however, you need to use some of these new attacks to first kick the victim uh, from the network before you as an adversary can connect under the victim's MAC address. And yeah, we created a tool to uh, test a lot of uh, home access points and also professional access points. I'm not going into the details here, but basically we, we have a tool to do some sanity text checks to make sure the tool works. We then have our vulnerability tests, and we then also have a second sanity check to basically see if the network actually had client isolation properly enabled. Because this attack only makes sense if the network is using client isolation. If the network is not using client isolation, well, then you might just as well use ARP poisoning and just intercept the traffic that way. So let's show a demo of this. So here I'm going to test a Ubiquiti access point. Um, and I have the password configured here. And you can see that I, I enabled client isolation on this uh, device. I'm now going to run the tool. I'm first going to let the tool check whether client isolation is indeed enabled. So that's C2C, client to client. And the tool is now trying to connect using two Wi-Fi dongles and it's sending traffic to uh, each other. So basically two clients are connected and they're trying to communicate with each other. And we can see that client to client traffic indeed is disabled on our uh, current access point. So it seems secure, right? Well, let's find out. We're now going to run our attack. So here again, the victim will connect first. It will send a certain message over the internet. We're now going to reconnect as the attacker while spoofing the MAC address of the victim. We're indeed now trying to authenticate um, under the victim's MAC address to the access point. This may take a few seconds, but eventually we indeed successfully connected to the access point. And in this case, we can actually see that we didn't receive traffic. And the reason why is that Ubiquiti is actually one of the very few access points that defended against this attack. So in a normal situation, at the end of that demo, you would be able to see that we were able to intercept traffic sent from the internet back to the victim. But um, yeah, I have to give a shout out to Ubiquiti here. They were the only ones that, as far as I know, that implemented a mitigation against this. Now, one remark I also need to make here is that with our attack, we can intercept traffic that is sent from the internet back to the client, but we cannot intercept traffic in the other way. We cannot intercept traffic that the victim is sending towards the internet. So the attack um, does have some limitations. It's not perfect, but it does show that client isolation on its own is not secure, because basically all professional and home access points that we tested were vulnerable to the attack. And if you want to uh, see a if you want to test your own network, you can uh, browse to the following link or scan the following QR code uh, to try out the tool.
And I will also come back in a bit on other ways that you can, that it is possible to defend against this attack. Uh, so there is some standardization we're going on to try to prevent this, uh, but I'll come back to that in a few slides. Another condition of this attack is that here, when the attacker is trying to spoof the MAC address of the victim and trying to reconnect, or just trying to connect to the attacker, we must be able to successfully connect with the network before the reply here from the internet is received. Because if this DNS or HTTP or whatever packet is received before we were able to connect as an attacker, yeah, then we will miss that packet. So the question is, can we indeed connect fast enough? And in the case of a WPA2 network, we can, because then it's uh, really trivial. It's very easy to kick the victim out of the network and connect ourselves. And basically, um, we also have some optimized ways to very quickly reconnect to a network. And then we can, as an attacker, connect to the network under 12 milliseconds. And if we compare that with the average latency on the internet, at least according to Verizon IP uh, statistics, the typical connection uh, latency of a transatlantic connection is around 70 milliseconds, and uh, the connection within Europe, Europe is about 13 milliseconds, meaning we are just fast enough to intercept the average uh, request response uh, sent over Europe. And in case we are too slow, then of course it's still possible to just perform the attack another time, but that does make the attack more noticeable because the victim will notice that you kick them out uh, of the network when doing this attack. Another remark, this is if you are trying to intercept UDP traffic sent to a client in a network. If you're trying to intercept TCP traffic, then it's actually very easy, because in that case, yeah, the server will just retransmit TCP packets until it has an acknowledgement, and then it will basically, uh, then you basically have much more time to reconnect as an attacker. Finally, as a side note, in the current explanation, I assumed that I would intercept traffic towards another um, client in the network. But there's nothing preventing you from also trying to attack the default gateway, so to intercept traffic to the default gateway or to a server in the local network as well. So if you look back here, what is the root cause of this issue? Well, the problem is that if we use a Wi-Fi network, we basically have multiple identities. We have an identity at the Wi-Fi layer, so at the 802.11x, so at the enterprise layer, where you often have an identity which is a username and a password, or maybe a client certificate. That's, in a sense, your identity when you're authenticating to the network. But when you're then using the network, you're basically identified by a MAC address on an IP address, and there is no strong connection between these two identities. Meaning, yes, I have to use my correct credentials, my the username that I have when connecting, but once I'm connected, connected, once I'm connected, I can still spoof any IP address or MAC address that I want, at least for most networks. And this basically means that, yeah, as a Wi-Fi attacker, I cannot spoof someone's identity, um, I cannot spoof someone's username or client certificate, but I can just spoof the IP and MAC address. So the problem is there's no strong um, correlation, there's no strong link between these identities at multiple layers of the network stack. I think another reason why this attack wasn't discovered before is that client isolation, in a sense, was bolted on uh, the Wi-Fi standard by the vendors. So client isolation is not part of the official uh, Wi-Fi standard. That is probably one reason why researchers uh, didn't look at it in detail. So how can we now fix this? Well, one possible defense is to disallow clients that are trying to connect using a recently used MAC address. Now that would of course incur some obvious reliability issues because if you're disallowing any client that has a MAC address that was recently also connected, then if a 
legitimate client would just lose its connection and trying to reconnect, yeah, that would cause for a lot of reliability issues. Um, so that defense is not really usable in practice uh, unless you have some way to, to avoid this timeout, which, ba which basically means if you can be sure that this MAC address that is trying to reconnect is indeed the same user as before, then you can allow this victim to instantly reconnect. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this attack, basically about this defense. Basically, the summary here is that we don't really have any good fixes. One fix may incur uh, reliability issues, and other fixes are default to generalize, because you basically need to securely recognize a client that was previously connected. And because of that, few vendors currently implement a defense or mitigation against this attack. Uh, this is also why this attack might be very useful if you are testing a company, because there's a high chance they might be vulnerable to this. It also means that, at least from a strict security standpoint, you cannot trust client isolation. A better approach would be to use a separate SSID, a separate Wi-Fi network, to isolate your clients or to use uh, VLANs to isolate clients. Um, that being said, client isolation is still useful because our attack can only intercept traffic in one direction, only from the internet back to the client. Uh, only that direction can we intercept. So please keep using client isolation. It makes attacks harder, but just be aware it's not a fundamental defense. Another part is that yeah, like, like I said, it's very hard to defend against it. There are some um, updates that have now been proposed to the Wi-Fi standard and that have meanwhile been accepted to better recognize a client that is returning to the network. And it's now part of the standard. And the vendors indeed implement this. Then we can, in the future, defend against this. So that leads to the conclusion of my talk. Basically, the summary is that the standard is sometimes vague. In the case of our attacks where we manipulate these buffered frames, the standard was not explicit on what you should do when a client disconnects. And the solution there is to then uh, remove and clear the buffers. And basically, this shows also that it's important to be explicit and precise when writing a standard because developers may not be aware of all the possible security issues. And we also had this demo where we bypassed client isolation. This is really a design flaw in client isolation, in my opinion, and as I mentioned, it's hard to prevent. With that, thank you for your attention, and if there's any questions, please ask. Thank you very much for the talk uh, and very very good presentation. A lot of work uh, done with it. But uh, my question is, can you shed some light on the like behind the scenes? And what I'm interested in is like, uh, for example, people who do pen testing on the web applications, on the binaries, like finding vulnerabilities, they would do fuzzing. Like on the cryptographic protocols, they also do modeling and finding like automatically model checking and whatnot. Uh, do you have the same things? And also, the second sub question is: uh, Have you thought of, you know, applying, you know, correlating with with uh, Mikos talk about uh, uh, AI fitting all of those uh, uh, papers and standards mm -hmm. into specialized AI models? So, two questions. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you for the question. Um, so, the first question is: If I interpret it correctly, what about fuzzing? And Fuzzing is indeed also a way that you can discover vulnerabilities in um, these network protocols. Uh, that is research uh, that we have looked in in the past as well, and others have also looked in. And I think that's definitely also still interesting to do as well. So I think there's also still a lot of room about for uh, fuzzing Wi-Fi implementations and fuzzing network implementations in general. 
So I definitely think that that is also an interesting uh, direction to still explore. In our work, we didn't focus on fuzzing, and now I'm going to the second question. So another way to um, find vulnerabilities or to protect protocols is to formally modify, model them. Um, and you have these days tools for that, so you don't need to do that manually. You have tools like Tamarin and ProVerif, uh, which are used uh, mainly by people in academia currently, to um, analyze protocols and try to define more formal security guarantees about the design of a protocol. And I think that def that is definitely a very useful thing to do, because when doing that, you are forced to think rigorously about the protocol and about the design. Um, and they have proven their value before. Um, some teams at Microsoft, for example, use these tools to analyze TLS. And they found vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities, by modeling the protocol and that by then proving it. That being said, these formal modeling tools are also not a magical solution, because it requires a lot of time to model a protocol. And often, you then also have to ask yourself, what will you model? Because you need to make an abstraction of your protocol. You cannot model all the details. So you will, also, you will always be analyzing um, a high-level abstraction of your protocol. And that can sometimes cause you to miss attacks. So in our work, we did not use a model checker. Um, we basically discovered this on our own. Um, so I think in practice you want a mix of uh, uh, fuzzing, you want a mix of model checking, you also want the mix of uh, looking at the standard yourself, and that combination will uh, provide a good result. Then the, the, the final question, using AI. That's indeed a good question. Um, on one hand, I think that these types of attacks will be hard to detect using at least the current AIs that we have, because it seems to require a, a kind of more original thinking that I currently at least do not yet see in AI. But of course, they might help, as mentioned in the previous talk, for fuzzing, and perhaps that if you do this kind of model checking, that you um, need to do less manual work when um, making formal models of protocols. So I do see them being useful uh, in the future. Um, but perhaps I'm a bit less uh, uh, maybe enthusiastic or pessimistic, depending on your viewpoint about AI. So I still think that some kind of human intervention will still be needed. But it's, of course, hard to predict the future. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, really good talk. I have kind of like three questions, <laughs> but hopefully they're quick. Uh, so one, you kept mentioning that enterprise WPA is also impacted. Is that the case? Like TLS and everything else, like it doesn't really matter the way you authenticate? Yeah, it doesn't matter how you authenticate. So whether you use client certificates, whether you use a username and password, uh, no matter which EAP protocol you use, that tech is possible. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, the other one is um, you tested a lot of uh, the open source firmware and whatnot, and obviously vendors keep using those drivers the same way. Do you also have like a list of like, because let's say knowing that Ubiquity has mitigations and you don't have to do the whole research yourself, do you have like a database bank where you like know which vendors are better or is that will be problematic? <laughs> yeah, so for the so for that last attack, the client isolation, there we tested both open source access points and also closed source professional ones. For the first attack, we focused on open source um, software because then we could also inspect the source code and it was uh, easier to basically get working attacks. On the URL that I mentioned during the talk, there we also have an overview of how some vendors uh, responded to our disclosures, so we, we try to have an overview of what is patched or not, uh, but it's not that easy to keep track of, but we do our best. So I would say check out the GitHub for more information. Okay, cool. Uh, 
And the last one is a little bit of a so what. Uh, like you can only detect when the frames come back from the internet, right? How many frames and what will you usually see in them? Also, given that a lot of people will use a VPN or a TLS connection. Yeah, that's indeed a good question. Um, so what we had in mind, what one possible attack scenario is, is that you can use this to intercept a DNS response from the victim. And then you, for example, uh, learn the uh, randomized uh, port on uh, I think there's another secret in the, in the DNS reply. And if you learn these secrets, you can then, when, when you let the client reconnect, you can then spoof also the DNA, uh, spoof a DNS response to the victim because you just intercepted that response. And you can then basically do things like DNS uh, poisoning to then intercept more traffic as well. That being said, if the victim is using something like TLS or VPNs, um, then you would also need to uh, perform a second attack, maybe on top of that. Um, previously, it was shown with TLS that some um, implementations used an all-zero key to protect, uh, I think, session resumption. So in the case of TLS, and if there's a higher layer protocol, the direct first impact is that you can see which IP addresses the victim is, vi is missing. And depending on the situation, you can consider that a security impact or not. Um, but, but I think it is fair to say that the impact of the attack is not as high as, for example, just learning the password of a network, which is perhaps one reason why vendors are a bit slower to defend against this, because the impact is depending on your network low, it, it really depends on the properties of your network. If privacy is essential, you will learn the IP addresses that someone is visiting. If your network is still using plain text traffic, which unfortunately is some the case, then it can be serious. So yeah, that depends on the network. Any other questions here or perhaps in the streaming room? I see one question there. Uh, thank you. I have one question regarding the denial of service attack. I think it was on slide 22 or something like that. Um, you mentioned that this SA query gets buffered because the, or as I understood it, because the hardware thinks the client is disconnected mm -hmm. or like it's and sleeping. It's in sleep mode, yes. Yeah. Does that also happen if the client is regularly chatting? Like if my device is constantly sending back and forth, will the hardware still think, hey, he must be sleeping? Or like, is that? So if the client is actively downloading a file or browsing the internet, then that would indeed interfere with the attack. Because if the attack, if, if the access point sees a legitimate frame of the client, the client will realize, oh, actually, the client is awake. Uh, therefore, the SA query can be sent. And that would interfere with the attack. So that's indeed one. Practical limitation, if the client is being active, then this attack will not work because the access point will immediately realize, okay, the client is awake again. So in that case, you would have to repeat this a few times uh, until you're basically lucky and the client was asleep long enough. But that's indeed one limitation. Um, we have some variants of other attacks, uh, but for that, I'm going to, going to have to refer to the paper. But for this attack, yes, that's a limitation. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for your attention.